Welcome to Chapter 4 on Banking Services, Savings and Payment Services. Yeah, banking. You need a financial institution. In fact, there are some people who don't use banks or credit unions, and we'll deal with them in a moment, in a few moments. But first, let's take a look at some overdraft fees. Dear students, how do you know a bank is making money? Their doors are open. Yeah, exactly, exactly. When you grow up, you want to be a bank. Barring that, you might want to work for a bank, but still, banks have licenses to make money. And one of the ways, one of the most egregious ways they make money are through overdraft fees. It's kind of difficult to get a hold of this information, so you peruse different articles and you'll get different numbers. But the Wall Street Journal a few years ago uh, boasted that banks were making almost $32 billion in overdraft fees. $35 per transaction average. Some people pay more. Some people, most notably credit union members, pay substantially less. Banking is one of those services that is very, very personal. So why you have chosen the bank or credit union that you have is entirely up to you, but we're going to do our best to get you to revisit your decision. In the assignment, we're going to ask you to go out there and take a look at all the different fees that you're paying and other competing institutions are charging and maybe you'll rethink your relationship with your bank or credit union. Maybe you won't. Let's get started. Slide number two. What are the different types of financial institutions? Well, for the vast majority of us folks, a commercial bank or a credit union is our choice. Now, what is the difference? Well, there are many. But to us, as retail customers, they look very, very similar. Commercial banks are, are for-profit institutions. They are insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Credit unions are non-profit organizations, and they have evolved to the point where they look very similar to commercial banks. But what's the big difference? They are non-profit. They are owned by the members. Hence, their fees are usually a whole lot less, and they pay us more in terms of deposits. Well, right now, not much more. In fact, probably not a whole lot more at all, but still. And that is why credit union membership has been growing very smartly over the last couple of decades or so, and the banks are not happy about this. Um, by the way, credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Association. I think that's what it stands for. But in either case, is your money safe in a bank or a credit union? And the answer is yes, folks. It's safe. Don't worry. They're both insured up to $250,000 per bank or per credit union. So, yeah, you don't have to worry about your money disappearing or anywhere, any like thing like that. So which do you choose? Hmm? Well, think about it, folks. I'm a big fan of credit unions. I'll tell you right off the bat. But everyone, as we said, is, is very different, and everybody's choice of bank or credit union is very different. But if you're like most people, you really need to get a bank or a credit union. Why? Because of the non-deposit type financial institutions that are uninsured that we now will take a look at. Money market mutual funds, well, that, that really should be discussed, and it will be discussed, in Chapter 11 when we get to the different types of investments, because it really is an investment. But it's a, it looks like a credit 
uh, it looks, I'm sorry, it looks like a checking account. They're not insured, but they might as well be. They're very, very, very close. But they're more for people who are already financially savvy. If you take a business 123, for example, you will learn far more about these. But once somebody is not banked, is not uh, well banked, so to speak, as we say, then they turn to alternatives such as post office or convenience stores for money orders. Okay, it's not that expensive. But what happens when you want to cash a check? Some of these check cashing outlets charge 1% to 2% or more, where if you have an account at a bank or a credit union, they will cash your checks for free. If you don't have an account there and you bring a check to them, they will if it's their check based on you know one of the accounts at their branch or their their company their bank or credit union they will want to charge you five bucks but what they'll really want you to do is open up an account <laughs> That's how they get new members the pawn shops and the loan until payday companies charge outrageous amounts of interest rates just unbelievable and where do you see most of these check cashing outlets, these pawn shops, these loan until payday companies? Do you see them in La Jolla or Rancho Santa Fe or Dalmar? No, you see them in in uh, Nasty City or San Yo Skid Row. Ha <laughs> ha, it's a joke, folks. I, I work in National City in San Isidro, so don't. Don't don't uh, and, uh, and I love those areas so don't don't get me wrong. In fact, I'm we'll talk about those when we get to chapter seven as actually pretty darn affordable and nice places to live because they're walkable. But this is where they plunk themselves down. In fact, there's a link to a to an article on the class website that discusses how expensive it is to be poor. It's just one of many articles that you can find about how. The poor are really um, raped. <laughs> we should use the, the the proper term. They are financially raped when it comes to uh, financial services. Now, in their defense, these places will say, "You don't understand. We're taking tremendous risks by taking on these payday loan until paydays or these checking ca check cashing these checks." And the truth is, folks, no, they're not. They, this is their business. They can smell a bad check halfway down the block. They're looking at individuals who are not well educated, hardworking, who have a regular paycheck and are just not good at doing their cash flow statement. And all of a sudden they're, they're short for the week and then they hit them with a 244% loan. So I'll get off my soapbox for the na for, for for the present, but if you have any folks in your family, any friends, or if you have not gone to a credit union or a um, bank and set up an account, it's time to do so. In fact, yours truly is a proud member of Mission Federal Credit Union and has been one for over 30 years. And if you go there and they give you a little bit of guff, tell them Mr. Piano at Southwestern Community College who teaches financial planning and money management recommended Mission Federal Credit Union. And he's also a member of Mission Federal. I don't know if that'll help or not. Because the truth is, Credit unions are picky about who they'll take. They don't want individuals who are irresponsible with their finances. And banks say they don't want them, but they love to hit them with those $35 overdraft fees. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, I got to continue and get a handle on my personal biases, which have no place at all inside the... Yeah. Slide number three. What are the types of financial save accounts? Well, there are savings accounts and then there are payment accounts. And savings accounts, uh, 
they they fall in, into two major types the savings accounts and share accounts at credit unions you see as when you go into a credit union and op ask to open up a savings account what they really open up is what's called legally a share account now it's not the same thing as a as a savings account at a commercial bank legally but for all important purposes folks for it is it, it in fact when you go into a credit union they don't call it a share account they call it a savings account just because that's what everybody else calls them the other type is a certificate of deposit and this is a fancy savings account what these do is these give you a better rate of interest on your money oh well, what's the catch well the catch is you are putting it on down you're putting the money into the account for a certain time a month six months a year and if you take the money out early you're going to have a penalty well currently interest rates are so low that it really doesn't matter a whole lot whether you go with the CD or the savings account you're still getting paid virtually nothing now the payment accounts the checking accounts the share draft accounts at a credit union again do they call it a share draft account no they call it a checking account when you go into a into a um, uh, credit union these are the daily transaction accounts that we use for our day-to-day -day purchases overdraft protection right this is the this ties into those overdraft fees it used to be that you would have an overdraft protection uh, plan for your checking account and they would take money out of your savings account if you wrote a check that was over your uh, uh, balance in your checking account and you may they maybe charge you two or five dollars or whatever they take the money out of your savings account and pay the check but banks got very smart with regard to these overdraft uh, uh, fees and now they know that people go into Jimba Jamba Jumba Juice and swipe their debit card for the grand total of $4.88 for 750 calories of sugar. And then they, they don't have the $4.88 for whatever reason. Well, the bank goes ahead and pays the $4.88 to Jimba Jamba Jumba Juice for the 750 calories of sugar and then hits you with a $35 overdraft fee right and, and you would think just deny it okay guys you know excuse me I, I didn't need that 750 calories of sugar for four dollars and 88 cents oh no we don't want you to be embarrassed think of how horrible you'll feel in front of that individual who doesn't care or doesn't know who you are so now the law says that you must opt in. You must tell the bank, yes, I want to be charged $35 for when I swipe my card for $4.88 of 750 calories of sugar. And they're very tricky. They have gotten people to opt in to these onerous, userous rape <laughs> fees, in my humble opinion. And so be careful, compare the costs, watch how cheap it is at a credit union compared to a, to a, to a bank. That's why on the assignment is to go out and then compare the fee, fees. Be careful. I said it, well, I just don't want them. If, if my debit card or, or my check, go ahead, just don't, 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 don't run it through. Don't, don't do it. My checking account card. I don't need the 750 calories of sugar. So anyway, that's the uh, checking account. Now, as we said, there are other types of accounts, which for the most part you won't be involved with unless you get involved in investing. And those are the money market accounts at banks and credit unions. Remember we said there were money market mutual funds at mutual fund companies? Well, banks and credit unions have these money market accounts. And again, they really don't look that much different from a checking account anymore other than they don't want you to use it for day-to-day -day transactions some of them have a limit of five or six transactions per month and you used to get a better rate of 
interest than your checking account, but not much anymore, folks. It, it's really paying hardly anything at these days. And we'll discuss these more in detail. This is where you store your investment money for the short term. Trust accounts. Trust accounts are uh, accounts that are for individuals who um, may be elderly and you know not be not able to take care of their finances anymore, or the very young who are orphaned, or or some people in not mental state to be able to take care of their accounts. And we'll talk about trust very briefly when we get to the very end of our our, our class. Uh, because trusts are tricky. <laughs> you need a lawyer. And then asset management accounts at brokerage firms. These used to be very popular. And I'm sure that with people in the more well-heeled areas of, uh, of, of, of our community, they still have these asset management accounts at, at, at brokerage firms. Hmm. Uh, they're very... Highbrow and uh, hoity-toity um, entities. You get your own personal uh, 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 banker, and and you get a concierge and all this wonderful, and you pay dearly for it. So I'm not suggesting I don't have one. And then club accounts. What are club accounts? Well, these things used to be popular in the 50s and 1950s and 60s, when the modern day um, a housewife, and that's who they targeted them towards, <laughs> women, uh, would put, to bring five or ten dollars or more of the, of your household allowance from your husband down to the bank and we'll put it in your vacation club or your Christmas club and we'll give you a toaster and we won't pay you any interest. And finally women started to wise up and thought, this is ridiculous. I mean, I can save my own money for a Christmas or for my vacation, but you know, if you're so inclined to go ahead and use it. The last one, now the last one, folks, when I first heard about these things, in Mexico they're called Tanda Cudnina, in uh, the Philippines it's called Paloagan. When I first heard about these, I was very skeptical. I come from a very different culture. I come from Philadelphia, South Philly, where I used to be all Italians, but now it's everybody down in South Philly. Um, what is it? Well, it's a group of people who get together, let's say 10, and they all want to save $1,000. Well, you could save $1,000 by putting in $100 into your uh, savings account every month, and then in 10 months, you'd have $1,000. But wouldn't it be nice if you could get that ten that $1,000 sooner? And that's the idea behind Tonda. A group of people, let's say 10, all get together and vow to put $100 into the pot every month for the next 10 months. Then they pull numbers out of a hat. The person who gets number one, you get the idea, right? Gets the, the $1,000 the first month. The person who gets number 10 gets the $1,000 at the end of 10 months. Well, that's what was going to happen anyway. So it's a way to advance the uh, the thousand dollars to the nine individuals and the tenth person is is basically left with the same situation they would have had if they had to do it on their own. Now, when I first heard this, I thought, wait a minute, what's to stop the first person from just taking the money and sending you a postcard from Aruba? And the woman who was from Mexico who ex explained it looked at me horrified, as if I had just said, what's you know, to stop the person from eating babies. It just isn't done. You don't understand. These are family. These are friends. You would not do something like that. Well, I'm from Philadelphia, and yes, we would. In fact, if I were running it and I got number one, I'd take the money and tell my buddies, I told you never trust nobody. This is a good lesson. You only lost 100 bucks. You see different cultures, different different customs. And so in the Mexican and Filipino cultures, Filipino cultures, family, friends are very important, and you just would not do that. And I, and I asked, well, th has there ever been a situation where somebody couldn't pay? Oh, yeah, somebody got sick and had to not work for a while, but, but we all chipped in. 
So, okay, you know, it's something that you, you, I, I'm not telling you this to tell you to go out and do it. I'm not telling you to, to not go out and do it. I'm just telling you it's out there. And whether you want to join or not, that's up to you. But I don't like the idea. Oh, anyway, anyway, let's continue. Slide number four. Uh, methods. Checking accounts. This is the preferred method for individuals. And nowadays, a checking account should be free as long as you sign up for electronic statements. Exactly. I mean, chop it, around. Some people prefer a, a a company or a bank or credit union where they do have to pay a, a monthly fee, but but you should be able to negotiate a uh, fee-free checking account. Watch out for the overdraft fees. What about other forms of payments? A certified check. Well, many of you don't even use checks, but uh, a certified check is a check that you take to your bank or credit union, and they will place a uh, stamp on it saying that the bank certifies, the credit union certifies that the funds are on on hold for this check. So what they do is they basically look at your checking account. They say, oh, okay, you have that much money in the account, and we will not let it go below that so that we certify that that check will be, uh, will be good when you pass it to onto the person you pay give it to it's you know maybe i mean sometimes they charge you five bucks sometimes they'll do one or two free every month a cashier's check is something very different the cashier's check sometimes called a bank check is based on the institution so this is um a check that is not out of your account it's out of the bank's account and before they give it to you they've taken the money out of your account put it into their account and these things used to be as good as cash well they still are but but you talk to some lawyers and they'll say yes of course a cashier's check is as good as cash uh, but there are some people who balk who don't trust them because in the past they have been forged and so uh, if you wanted to make a big purchase trend uh, uh, Real estate transactions used to all be via cashier's check, but now it's all electronic. They wire the money. Uh, buying a huge purchase such as a car or, or, or the like was done via cashier's check, but now they much prefer electronic. Money orders, as we said, are, depending on how many transactions you make, a relatively inexpensive way to have a checking account run down to the, to the convenience store, run down to the post office. Traveler's checks used to be very, very popular, but with now ATM cards, credit cards, debit cards, they're not as popular as they used to be. But the company you, you go through guarantees that even if you lose the traveler's checks, they will um, uh, make good on them. Why do they want you to use traveler's checks? Because they know people don't use them all. They put them in their drawer <laughs> and forget about them. And then 12 years later, go, oh my goodness, look at this. There's 100 bucks sitting in our, in our, my underwear drawer. Now, the newer forms of payment are, first of all, what the young folks use uh, over and over and over again uh, for that 750 calories of sugar at Jimba Jamba Jumba Juice, your debit cards, your credit cards, gift cards and smart cards. Eh, I'm not a big fan of gift cards. People love to give them, but I, I don't, I don't want to get them. And I don't really want to give them. I'd much rather give cash. But people say, oh, that's so gauche. I'd much rather give them $25 in the form of a Home Depot or a whatever card or a, or a iTunes card. Uh, all right, do it. But why do the why do the retailers love these things? Right, because, again, they know that some people are not going to use them. And so it's free money for them. Now, how about PayPal or Apple Pay or Android Pay or Walmart Pay or who else is getting into the act? Right. These companies are not stupid. They see the banks getting rich off of all these transactions and all these fees. They want to get in on the act. So now you wave your not-so-smartphone in front of a little terminal and they take money out of your account. That scares the living daylights out of me, folks. Just... All you got to do is accidentally wave it in front of, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, I'm not involved, so don't ask me, you got the wrong guy. 
Sometimes things in the future are marvelous and wonderful, and sometimes they wind up being a major headache, and I am absolutely convinced that one day we're going to wake up and there's going to be some serious hell to pay because some thug in Russia or China or eh, who knows, Santee somewhere will have figured out the way to bilk the entire system and bring it to its knees. But then I'm paranoid, all right? And just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're out to get you. And when there's money involved, you know they're out to get you. Slide number five. What about ATM? Now, what does ATM actually stand for? Always taking money. Right. That's what it stands for, folks. Don't let them tell you it stands for automated teller machine. Wrong. It stands for always taking money. That is why we ask you in the assignment to go through and... Compare fees amongst the different financial services entities, banks and credit unions. You know what the ATM is all about. It's the wonderful machine that dribbles money out of your account $2.50 at a time. So please compare ATM fees before you open the account. Use your own bank's ATM when possible. This is one of the things I like about credit unions. Credit unions are not stupid, folks. They know that they're not as, you know, powerful as, as the big banks. So they, they banded together. And now you can use almost virtually any ATM from, from virtually any uh, credit union across the nation. Plus any 7-Eleven, too. 7-Eleven's gotten involved somehow. So that, that's how they compete against the Bank of Armenia or uh, Fells Largo which have branches all over the world, right? Or not all over the country, I guess. So you decide. You decide, but hopefully you'll do a little bit of research and decide, well, you know, I'm happy where I am. Uh, I know it's going to cost me more. Or, you know what, maybe I want to switch over to San Diego County Credit Union or Navy Federal or whatever. Slide number six, savings plans. Well, I don't even know why we're talking about this. When they're not paying us anything, 0.1% or 0.01%. But we do need to understand annual percentage yield. If only because when we get to Chapter 5 on credit, we're going to talk about annual percentage rate. Annual percentage yield is what we get paid from the banks and credit union, unions. And annual percentage rate is what we pay to them. And our rate of return, our yield, our annual percentage yield is calculated via a set methodology that is was set back in the 1970s because some companies were were playing loose with the facts and saying they were paying a certain amount when they really weren't so in order to be able to compare apples to apples the truth in savings act uh, as opposed to the Truth in Lending Act, which we'll see in the next chapter. The Truth in Savings Act set a methodology that all banks and all credit unions must use to tell you how much they are paying you in terms of their rate of return on your money, you know, the money you lend to them. And as we said, it's, it's pitiful now, but eventually it'll bump back up to 4 or 5%, I don't know, someday. I don't know when. I hope to live long enough to see it happen. But you remember Chapter 3 and the marginal tax rate and you hope that you'd never have to see it again and you done with all those... <laughs> no, folks, you really should understand your marginal tax rate. So go back to Chapter 3 and review it if you don't understand it. Because when you save money in a bank or a credit union, you also have to pay taxes on those earnings. What? <laughs> yeah, well, that's how it works, folks. So even if you're earning, say, 4%, which you're not earning these days, if you're in the 25% tax bracket, 1 minus the marginal tax rate. Look familiar? But instead of being on the bottom of the formula as it was on Chapter 3, it's now on the top. So 1 minus 25% multiplied times your rate of return. So even if you are, are earning 4%, after you pay your 25% tax to the feds, you're actually only getting 3%. And we're not including the state, but that, you know, you have to think about that too. No social security taxes 
on uh, earnings through savings accounts. That's only on income that you earn through a job. Okay, make sense? All right, so so I know you really want to forget marginal tax rate, but we're going to come back to it later, so you you really should learn it. So there, here's your second chance if you didn't get it the first time. Slide number seven, check reconciliation. Oh, Piano, are you serious? You know, I kind of know how much is in my account. Well, you're in the majority if you don't reconcile your checkbook account with the bank or credit union because more than half of Americans do not reconcile their checkbook balances. The most important thing, in my humble opinion, is to keep it current. Write down every transaction. Now, it's called a check register. You don't have to call it that, but that's what it's called in the, in the financial world. And it's simply a list of all the transactions that you make. And the important thing is to write it down when it happens. I don't care how cute she is and you're at the ATM machine and she's going to think you're a dork if you write it down right there. But uh, it's up to you. It's up to you. I keep an electronic register and a written one. And people say, why bother? You're very good with spreadsheets. Why do you keep a, an electronic spreadsheet and write it down? Because, uh, exactly, computers are not infallible. Neither am I. And so I'm double-checking myself, so to speak. Uh, that's important. In my humble opinion, you decide. Bank statement. Well, how many people wait for their bank statement at the end of the... No, everybody now goes online and... And they email you the little statement saying, little email saying, yeah, your bank statement is ready, but most people don't even bother looking at it. They go online and see their account. We on the website have a check reconciliation form. When I did personally get a bank statement from Mission Federal, they would include one for you to use. They were, you know, they were encouraging you to do with it. But now we have regist check register spreadsheets. There are two on the website and commentaries and a little presentation for you to take a look at to uh, see how you can use the spreadsheet so there's no excuse. And then some of these programs such as Quicken, they were very popular several years ago, but it seems like people have just decided that hey, I can do it myself. I don't need Quicken or what's the other one? Money um, to, uh, to do my reconciliation for me. Thank you very much. I can do it myself. If you do it. And so, because one of these things with Quicken or Mint, that's the other one, Mint, Mint, it's the same people, Quicken, Mint. Uh, they're looking at all your transactions, folks, and making a demographic profile, which means they want to learn as much, much about your uh, financial life as possible so they can sell you more stuff. And if you think that is good, you go right ahead, but I don't think it's good. I don't want them to know anything about me. Go away, Quicken, go away, Mint. Is the company's actually into it. Same company that makes TurboTax. So slide number eight. How do we do a check reconciliation? Well, I can tell you here on slide number eight, but it's a whole lot better. In fact, that's what we're going to do in the presentation on check reconciliation. You're going to go through the steps to uh, reconcile your um, account with the bank's account. And here are the steps, and I'm not going to go through them here because we do them in the presentation. You really need to go through the presentation, folks. Or if you're if you're if you're already know how to do this, go ahead and do it without the presentation. But this in the face-to-face -face class, this is where we would walk through the reconciliation together. We would do it together, and some people are a little bored because they're already slick with numbers or they take an accounting. And other people are, you can just tell their knuckles are getting white and their, their sweat is pouring down their brow and they're scared to death. But really, folks, once you've done it a few times, especially with the spreadsheets, the electronic spreadsheets, which make life a whole lot easier, you will find it ain't that hard until, exactly, until you can't find that 35 cents. You're off by 35 cents, and why is that? And it drives you absolutely bonkers, and you go back through your statement. You go back through online and try to find out, oh, I transposed those two numbers, and whatever whatever reason. Yeah, so, so yes, it, there's going to be times when you're going to want to pull your hair out, but you can recover from those, especially with the uh, new tools that we have at our disposal. 
and survive. Okay, so that's our discussion of banking, credit unions, payment services, checking accounts, savings accounts. We'll see you in the next presentation where we <clears throat> discuss the wonderful world of credit and debt. <sighs> Thank you all again for being in Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management. All of us at Southwestern are very proud, happy, honored that you're with us.